Well, good evening all and welcome to our Wednesday evening uh, webinar. Uh, this evening we have uh, what I think is going to be an extremely interesting uh, series of presentations on chest and thoracic trauma. And I was reminiscing earlier uh, with the speakers that it's one of the few times I know, I that, know that I, I actually I, saved somebody's uh, life by doing um, a, a thoracotomy for somebody with a, uh, uh, a, a penetrating wound in the chest uh, that relieved um, a, a, um, a major uh, uh, problem. So uh, it's yeah. my pleasure to ask uh, Keith uh, Sinnott, who is the National Clinical Lead for Trauma Services, uh, to chair the session this evening. Uh, the usual rules apply. If uh, you can, please turn off your camera. Uh, that way we uh, have fewer uh, uh, moving heads on the screen and we can concentrate on the talks. And if you're not actually uh, speaking, then please do uh, turn off your mic. That way we can um, uh, avoid getting any of the feedback. Uh, do please use the chat function uh, to uh, put, send in any questions that you might have and uh, Keith will act as moderator and will uh, put your questions to our speakers um, uh, at the appropriate time. So Keith, thank you very much for organising it. Thank you to our speakers and I look forward to an interesting uh, session. Thank you, Keith. Thanks very much, Professor O'Connell. Um, I think, as you say, this should be a very interesting topic, and, and I know it again in the pre-meeting, it, it was mentioned that Halloween is coming up, so perhaps there could be a few gory slides in this presentation, um, but I'll leave that up to the speakers. Um, this is, I suppose, a relatively rare traumatic condition that is seen um, in the context of kind of trauma provision and trauma care, but while it's rare, it's potentially catastrophic, but also potentially salvageable. Um, but the difficulty with lots of these conditions is, that they really are time critical, people are on the risk of dying. So with the salvageability comes con kind of questions of what should be done and perhaps more specifically where and by whom it should be done. And I think reflecting that we've got a, 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 ra a range of speakers tonight to talk about different aspects of managing thoracic trauma. Um, it's, I'm delighted to welcome Fran O'Keefe, who's an emergency medicine consultant in the Matter Hospital who runs the procedures course, uh, which I think was inaugurated in Australia. And he's now kind of brought to this hemisphere, which describes this and lots of other procedures that can be done in the emergency room. Um, developing technologies and treating these kind of injuries often, like so many other things, involve interventional radiology. And uh, Leo Lawler, who's an interventional radiologist, is going to speak about the role of that in the management of thoracic trauma. Um, Leo has recorded his talk because he's actually away on holidays in uh, Spain and we're hoping he'll be able to join us. Um, but again, as a sign of his enthusiasm for, for talking about the topic, he's kind of happily uh, given his presentation in advance. Um, and then finally, Professor um, James O'Connor, who is a chest and trauma surgeon in the, the renowned Or Adams Cowley Shock Trauma Center in the University of Maryland in Baltimore is gonna give us the uh, surgical perspective. And I suppose we should be mindful that the kinds of trauma that he sees are probably quite different from what we see because thankfully the amount of penetrating trauma is slightly different. Uh, but Jim is a great speaker with huge experience, not just <clears> in thoracic <throat> trauma, but in trauma in general. And I, I'm delighted that he agreed to talk and delighted that our, our own thoracic surgeons when invited suggested that perhaps a view from abroad might be something that people would be interested in. So um, I think we'll learn an awful lot. Um, we'll take questions as we go through, although I suspect that um, questions will be aimed at all, the, at all the speakers in one, so perhaps we might keep some of them until the end of the presentation. So what I'd ask first of all is Fran, if he'd like to give his talk. Yeah. Great, um, okay, so that's great, Keith. Thanks very much, so a good summary of, uh, of things at the minute. Um, so I'm delighted to be here to talk to you this evening about uh, um, resuscitative thoracotomy. It's a, a very interesting topic and does kind of create a lot of chats around it. And, and, and I think Keith has alluded to this is, is, you know, in Ireland with the advent of our trauma system, uh, where are we going with this particular procedure? Um, I'm going to talk about my experience uh, in doing this procedure and how that's changed over the years. Um, my initial exposure to this was in Australia, where I did my SPR training uh, at the Alfred Hospital, which is 
one of the largest um, uh, trauma centers in the southern hemisphere and uh, it's it's kind of somewhere that is well known and has produced a lot of literature on this procedure uh, i think we're jumping ahead there guys we go back one slide yeah thanks um and uh and as i say giving my perspective on it from what i've learned in australia and how that's translated over to my time in ireland where i've been for the last number of years working at the matter uh, i must emphasize that my talk is very much directed at the non-expert um, so this is for uh, the non-resuscitative trauma surgeons amongst us, and there are they are few and far between on these islands, um, as well as my time in Australia, where the kind of classic trauma surgeon, as, as we might know it, uh, really doesn't exist. And this is uh, outside of North America. This is a challenge for us. And again, it opens discussions for us this evening. Um, so when I'm talking about this procedure, I'm really directing it. Uh, at uh, many of the people who are on this call and will be the future um, uh, who will hopefully be performing this procedure. And the next slide, please. Uh, so this is an important disclaimer. This lecture will not make you credentialed in doing a resuscitative thoracotomy. This comes as much of a surprise to people that I have uh, talked about this in previous times. So please don't think that by watching this, uh, um, you will be able to do uh, a resuscitative thoracotomy. However, I will, I will be describing it, um, but I'll be describing it in, in such a way that, because uh, we've only got 15 minutes, I don't want to, uh, I can't go into the, 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 the real nitty bits of it, but um, I, I will ask you to think about this procedure as something that you may consider doing, um, because we need, we should be doing more of them, but we should be doing them on the right people in the right way. And um, uh, hopefully that will come out uh, towards the end of the lecture and we can discuss it afterwards. Next slide, please. So just some common myths uh, that I think uh, it's good to call out at the start. So traumatic cardiac arrests, they all die. These are things that I hear commonly around the hospital or around when I'm speaking with colleagues. Um, no, they don't all die. And in fact, we have very good evidence to suggest that they don't die. And we have good numbers uh, in, the, in, in certain populations where people are not dying um, where they would have previously. I often hear that thoracotomy is a futile procedure. This is not the case. In fact, technically, it's actually quite a simple procedure, but it has been built up into being something overcomplicated and difficult, um, which in the case of a resuscitative thoracotomy, the procedure itself is not. Um, I often hear, and, and Keith did allude to it as well, is that there are discussions about this should not be done in the ED or by ED staff or non-trained staff. So I completely disagree with this because by its very nature, the ED is where most of these people are and um, they're in extremis and this happens in the emergency department. And absolutely, I agree that in the ideal world, this should be done by the right person, which would be a thoracic surgeon who has a special interest in trauma in theatre with a full complement of staff around him. But in reality, uh, in these islands, as, as which is what I'm talking about, this is just uh, not the case or is very difficult to achieve. Um, in North America, trauma surgeons where penetrating trauma is far more common uh, than we have it here. It is done by people who do it a lot, but over here it's not. And we need to get to a place where we have appropriately, appropriately trained staff doing this procedure at the right time and in the right population. So next slide, please. And um, just some numbers to begin with. This is my really my only slide with uh, um, uh, kind of uh, stats on it. And this comes from uh, Australian Victorian numbers. Um, so looking at out of hospital cardiac arrest there on the left side, this is so non-trauma related. About 30% survived to hospital and then 12% survived to hospital discharge. Not great numbers, um, but still uh, significant. If we look at traumatic cardiac arrests in the kind of greater scheme of things, we get about 6.6%. Um, they make up 6.6% of cardiac arrests. 15% of these survive to hospital and then about 5% survive to hospital discharge. So these are really significant numbers and these are people's lives that we can save. Um, yeah, next slide, thank you. So what is a resuscitative thoracotomy? Um, so in the context of trauma, this is an absolutely immediate thoracotomy uh, in a patient who has been injured usually by either a penetrating wound or, or a blunt trauma, but in, you know those who survive, it's mostly penetrating trauma. It's an immediate thoracotomy in someone who's in a peri-arrest straight um, or in actual cardiac arrest. And this is something that can be done, their chest can be opened, and we can deal with the pathology that's underneath there. Next slide, please. 
OK, so why do we do it? So when we do the procedure, you know, what are we doing when we do it? So the two primary goals in the non expert, um, which will be most of the people who are performing this procedure, is release of cardiac tamponade. Cross party support. And it means essentially that organizers or venues themselves. Uh, Fran, you're muted. So I was muted. Uh, sorry, yeah, I muted ahead, too. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, sorry, so back to, so why are we doing this? So the two most important procedures, uh, what we're doing here is we're releasing cardiac tamponade. Okay, this is the primary goal. And then control of that cardiac wound, if we can find it in the heart. So these are the two simplest procedures and technically they are relatively simple to do. And we should be uh, um, teaching people how to do this. And this is in the, in the hands of a non-expert. When we move on to the kind of a more uh, experienced provider, there are maneuvers such as aortic cross clamping or aortic occlusion, uh, sorry, occlusion, which can increase cardiac perfusion and again uh, reduce bleeding in the, the below the diaphragm where other injuries may be involved. And um, the evidence uh, that this is effective is. is uh, scant but but it's still something that we do and then hyler twists again twisting lungs on their the on their hilum uh, in unilateral kind of lung bleeding but really what i would just say is that the two primary goals are release of cardiac tamponade and control of that cardiac wound and i would often say that putting if there's something there that's bleeding and if it is a penetrating knife wound a finger in that wound can often save a life next slide please <laughs> So who gets a resuscitative thoracotomy? Well, this is the question that really strikes fear in people. And I think this is probably making that decision is the hardest part of the procedure. And it's often uh, what gets people confused. And, um, uh, and as I say, I, I used to think that this was the hardest part of the procedure and I, I still do when I'm teaching it. Um, but what we do know is that if you have somebody who has a penetrating knife wound to their chest in the region of their heart, and if they are peri-arrest or if they arrest right in front of you, chances are that if you do a resuscitative thoracotomy, they have a good chance of survival. So that is a very definite group. And um, next slide, please. Thankfully, we do have a lot of excellent guidelines and um, two of the most famous and probably the most famous would be the EAST guidelines. And these are both from North America and the Western Trauma Association. These guidelines are fantastic, um, but they are very surgically focused. And when I mean what I mean by surgically focused, it is for the practitioners in North America. And I suppose their uh, adoption to the European or the um, kind of Australasian sphere uh, has been questioned, but there's no doubt that they do provide um, some excellent uh, evidence base for this procedure. They focus on a number of things. So they focus on the location. So is it kind of thoracic wound or is it an extra thoracic wound? They focus on the timing. So how long, and if the patient has arrested, have they arrested in front of you or has it been a few minutes? Um, often what I find is that timing piece is really difficult. So any of these that I've been involved in, which has been a number of them, really trying to find out an accurate time, uh, unless the patient arrests in front of you can be very difficult. And that's because the paramedics who are bringing them in, just trying to get those exact times can be difficult. Um, yeah, we can stay on this slide. You can, sorry, yeah, that's fine. And one of the other things that they often talk about in these uh, uh, guidelines uh, are signs of life. And for, for me, um, so if we, yeah, we can stay there, please. And um, for me, signs of life is one of the most difficult aspects of trying to work out what's going on. It might sound simple, but it's not. And I think anybody that's been involved in this procedure will, will understand what I mean. So when you're trying to look for a pupillary response, a response, a carotid pulse, spontaneous ventilation, a measurable BP or extremity movement, all of these things in a very high octane situation where people's uh, uh, you know heart rates are up and everyone's uh, feeling the pressure um, and a patient is dying in front of you trying to find these are are, are difficult and that's why the use uh, so, so cardiac electrical activity is is absolutely vital so if you can find out is there electric electrical activity in the heart going on in these patients and um, this can help you uh, really decide where you're going. And that's where the advent of ultrasound or echo, simple echo, I'm not talking about anything complicated. It's as simple as putting a probe on the chest and seeing, do we have any cardiac electric, electrical activity? And in the right patient, if you see that, 
you can you, you can do a thoracotomy uh, in the right patient. Next slide, please. Really, a really important slide, and and the evidence would say uh, uh, when it's time to stop. So if you do have accurate timing. Um, and usually that's if the patient's in front of you or if you have a really clear time from pre-hospital. In the case of penetrating trauma, if they have been in cardiac arrest for more than 15 minutes, or in the case of blunt trauma for 10 minutes, their likelihood of survival is dismal and really the procedure should not be performed. Okay, next slide, please. Um, it's my last slide with any percentages on it. Um, but just looking at survival rates, if we look at the EAST guidelines, who I mentioned previously, the um, if you look at, uh, they did a large systematic review and it's some of the best evidence we have. So in penetrating trauma, and when I say with and without, I mean with signs of life or without. With penetrating trauma, with signs of life, uh, they have a 21% chance of survival. Without, it's about 8%. In blunt trauma, it's far less as we'd expect. You're talking 4.6% and then really uh, uh, dismal um, kind of survival rates in those without signs of life of 0.7%. Okay, next slide, please. Um, you don't need to kind of hone in on this. It's really just to uh, uh, to identify what we have here in Europe. So the European Resuscitation Council has taken a kind of a different view, and I think that's a good thing in the context of the Irish system um, and the UK system. The focus is more on a kind of a combined approach when dealing with a trauma patient. So are there any other things that we can be doing in conjunction? So use use of the trauma team. So uh, giving blood, looking for potentially other reversible causes. And thoracotomy comes down the line a little bit as all these other things are going on. And they really talk about, have we got the right expertise uh, in the room? Do we have the right equipment? Are we set up in the right environment? And, and, and of course, they take aspects of the uh, the North American guidelines around timing. And next slide, please. So now kind of just moving on to the procedure itself. And this, I think, is a, an important slide for, for me to get across um, to, to everybody on the talk tonight. Uh, this is something that you need to ask yourself if uh, you're involved in trauma patients and thinking about doing thoracotomies. You need to ask yourself, do I know this inside out? And if you're going to perform this procedure, you absolutely have to know it inside out. You have to know all aspects of it. You need to be confident. And, and competent in the procedure, knowing all the complications and all aspects of the procedure. Um, equally important is, is my team ready? So those around me who are going to be doing this with me, are they ready? Now, they may never have seen a thoracotomy, but they certainly should, be have, should have been exposed to, to potentially what might go on in this uh, scenario. And so doing this as a kind of, a, a, I suppose, a lone ranger, um, is not a good idea and, and we know that this gets things uh, kind of going, conversations going in the wrong way. So it's really important that the team are around you. And, and my last sentence uh, and very important is, are my intentions honourable? Um, I've taken this from a, uh, a gentleman called John Hines, who was a, uh, a fantastic resuscitationist and an anaesthetist up in Northern Ireland, who unfortunately passed away a number of years ago. But he gave a great talk on this and, and his intent, his question he always asks is, are they honourable? If I'm doing this procedure, could this actually save this person's life? Or am I doing this procedure because I think it's cool and I need the practice? Um, so I think we both, we all know the answer to, to these questions. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in terms of expertise and environment, I think it's absolutely vital that you prepare, prepare, prepare. Um, the environment that you do this in should have some idea uh, of what you're about to do. And um, you know, clearly the expertise in the room, uh, often in the, the context of the UK and Ireland experience, the expertise is often not a cardiothoracic surgeon or a trauma surgeon, but the ED personnel um, or uh, kind of surgical trainees who may have uh, uh, learned some of this uh, procedure. We do have to engage with our thoracic colleagues and we have to get the ex their expertise and um, develop standard operating procedures for this to happen in the right manner. And I'll just allude to that more towards the end. But it's vital that we prepare and that we simulate. And this is just a picture from the Matter Hospital in terms of uh, with us doing exactly that. Next slide, please. Um, the equipment that you need. Now, I uh, put this up on purpose because, yes, you can do a thoracotomy with these with a knife, a sharp knife. Uh, sharp scissors and uh, 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 tough cut scissors. But um, the whole idea I'm making is that we need to keep our equipment simple and low tech. Next slide, please. Uh, 
Uh, this is uh, something similar to what we have in the matter. And um, again, it is simple, low tech, low tech and it's pre-packed. Your equipment needs to be pre-packed because it's something that's not going to be used that often and people need to be getting used to it. Um, so uh, whatever that may be, there are a number of different variations, but keeping it uh, uh, very simple is key. And having a large thoracot thoracotomy pack from theatre, which you've never used, is a recipe for disaster. So next slide, please. Um, again, this is something matter resource trolley. Uh, this is our uh, specifically dedicated to chest trauma and uh, our thoracotomy packs are on the bottom. Next slide, please. So in terms of doing it, um, moving on to that, uh, I've used this um, hot, the, the, the hot mnemonic, and this is really just a mnemonic about how do we rapidly identify and reverse uh, pathology associated with trauma. So once we get down to the bottom, we're talking about putting our ultrasound probe on and then moving on to thoracotomy. And next slide, please. Um, just uh, an important aspect of this. I think what's happened with resuscitated thoracotomy is that we have um, made this an overcomplicated procedure. I think that we have built it up in such a way that it is preventing people from doing it. And we've often classified this as a super heroic procedure and it has scared people away from uh, uh, doing it. And we need to move away from that and think about it as a technically doable procedure. Um, that we can teach people to do. So next slide, please. Um, my preferred technique, and this has changed over time, is certainly the clamshell. Um, so the clamshell procedure simply involves making bilateral thoracostomies on both sides of the chest and then essentially joining up the dots. You need a very sharp knife to do this. And then to get through the sternum, you need uh, the tough cut scissors. Um, and in its simplest way, uh, this is how you do it. Um, next slide, please. And this is just a cadaveric uh, uh, idea of what a clamshell thoracotomy does. But what this does is it allows full exposure in the chest um, and really allows you to identify for those two simple things I talked about, which are uh, the pericardium, which you can see here in the center. Um, and you lift up the pericardium, cut through the pericardium and release that tamponade and then expose the heart and try to find the cardiac wound if it's there. It also allows you to identify other pathology um, in, in, in more expert hands. Um, I'm just going to show a slide for one minute, or sorry, a video for one minute. And this is a little bit gory. So if there's any children in the background, please uh, um, uh, turn them away. And this is Morgan McMonagall, who many of you will know, a trauma surgeon in Waterford. Handle down, thank you. Handle down, up nice and wide. Okay. Yeah, it's got a little bit. Okay. Heart is beating. Heart is beating. Nice and wide. Wide and go. Wide and go. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Okay, some toes that go. Okay, Okay, we can stop the video there. Okay, okay. Um, so uh, just it's always good to have some some gore and special around Halloween, but also really just to get an idea. It's just a very brief view of what things can be like, which are very difficult and very challenging circumstances. And that's uh, and thanks, Morgan, for allowing me to share that video. Um, and that gentleman did survive. Um, just my final thoughts on uh, uh, it's my last slide. Um, really important. Uh, in terms of any resuscitated thoracotomy is that you have a hot debrief with your staff afterwards and a cold debrief. And so it's important to kind of talk about what happened and because it can be quite a confronting procedure for people. You need to think about the forensic aspects. So this is inevitably going to be a forensic case. Your notation needs to be meticulous and keep all the clothing. Governance, really important piece, and I'm sure Keith will allude more to this, but as a, with the advent of our national trauma system, we need to have a kind of a national and, and certainly a, a network governance policy around thoracotomies to allow us to do these. And we need to be making those policies with our thoracic surgeons. Um, and then finally, we need to be credentialing people and how we best do that is up to us as a, as a country. Um, and hopefully uh, uh, we can move forward with getting this done as soon as possible. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Fran. Uh, very thought provoking. I'm sure lots of people have had lots of thoughts about it as you talk. I, I think it might be best to give the three talks and then have questions because I suspect each of the three speakers will have perspectives which are relevant to one another.
Um, so what I might do is 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 ask Catherine to see can she run uh, Leo Lawler's talk now. Hello everyone. Thank you to Keith Sinnott and the RCSI for asking me to come along and share a little bit of our world in interventional radiology with you today. I have no disclosures to make. I will admit we haven't figured it all out yet by any stretch. This is not an expert review. This is just somebody sharing an awful lot of experience and I hope that's a value to you. We're humbled every week with patients and their conditions and um, it's a lifelong learning process and hopefully for you this is part of that. Minutes. I'll try to cover these four topics which I think will give you a flavour of where is in 2021. So let's get into it. Two days after interventional radiology and trauma you should understand that we're involved not just in the acute point of care, uh, but actually in the subacute and the chronic phases. We're generally asked to do to address some aspect of the patient's care and convert an uncontrolled situation to a controlled situation. We have a silent partner role throughout their care as well, where there's a lot of activity around antibiotic access, management of dialysis, enteral feeding, drainage of collections, etc., which happens throughout the polytrauma patient's stay. I would break down our role in terms of diagnostic procedures, definitive therapeutic procedures, a lot of procedures which are, which are about getting the patient to the next stage of their therapy, and prophylactic procedure, procedures like IVC filters. Um, and we inevitably end up managing the outcomes or the complications or the sequelae of trauma and indeed its therapy. It's worth remembering also that we're multimodality now. We've gone beyond the angio suite into the CT scanner. We have a dedicated ultrasound procedure suite and so on. We're multi-specialty in so far as our radiographers, our nurses and our cells are all basic trained. A lot of us have imaging qualifications and fellowships in terms of diagnostic imaging, trauma imaging and so forth. And then on top of that, again, we have interventional radiology skill sets and fellowships. We've been embedded for a long time in both the clinical, medical and surgical spe specialties throughout the hospital. Um, we are steadily evolving from what was a passive demand led role into a more active um, role. And we're evolving in parallel, therefore, from what was a disruptive technology into something that's a lot less disruptive and mainstream. I'll give you a broad outline and case examples to illustrate where we're at. So today, for me, we manage a lot of our trauma with whole body CT angiography, therapeutic angiography, which is really focused and has a mission statement before you do it, and therapeutic ultrasound. We've largely abandoned as dead technologies, plain radiography, diagnostic and geography in the conventional sense, diagnostic ultrasound and conventional basic CT. MRI plays a support role. One of the first tips or advices I might give you is don't treat an image. Some of the imaging in the modern era is very dramatic. It's a siren call. It will drag you onto the rocks. An image with bleeding does not need an intervention by anybody sometimes. So we've got to stand back, take those images and really try to contextualize them to where the patient is at, the blood tests are at, et cetera, et cetera. We're probably best known for managing bleeding. It's a big part of our unscheduled care in the non-trauma setting, stenting and embolizing blood vessels to cause of bleeding complications. When I came back first many years ago to the Matter Hospital, where it seemed that we could provide value added was in the realm of deceleration injuries and blunt trauma to the chest resulting in acute traumatic aortic injury. It's a good subject for this forum because it illustrates the spectrum of diseases from minimal aortic injury to full transections and bleeding. It illustrates our close collaboration with our cardiothoracic surgical colleagues with whom we share a vernacular from doing a lot of scheduled work together. And it became a no-brainer, if you excuse, excuse the pun, insofar as 
a lot of these patients had a in head injury and bypass maybe wasn't an option. Opening the chest in an imminently rupturing aorta wasn't necessarily an option. And we needed to quickly get some of these patients to other things. Here's an example of a patient, deceleration injury, road traffic action, rent in the uh, aorta, an endovascular stent, definitive therapy. This patient, road traffic accident, catastrophic injury to the spine they put in a stent and then we have a prompt move on to spinal repair this patient penetrating injury stabbed the chest unlucky enough to get an internal mammary branch bleed we do an embolization straightforward therapy we have seen massive hematomas from this particular injury the alternative, of course, is a sternotomy and a much bigger and involved procedure. This patient, shoulder injury, tears one of the circumflex humeral vessels, gets an axillary bleed and a pseudoaneurysm, a fairly straightforward embolization, a difficult uh, place to access for surgery. Similarly, a patient with a stab wound, a laceration of the axillary artery, a covered stent deals with it. A lot of this anatomy is tiger country at the best of times. But then when you disrupt the tissue planes with trauma, everything gets very, very challenging. It's worth maybe mentioning to you that a lot of patients come back to us many times. And that is because so, a, a lot of what we do is multi-stage, requires multiple procedures and drains and changes before we actually get to completion. And of course, many of these patients are on Here's a patient with a complex aortic injury. We stented it. He had liver and splenic injury. And then six months later, he comes back breathless because a diaphragmatic tear has now become manifest and a huge chunk of colon has gone up in the chest. This patient has a fall, has a chance fracture, has an, inter has an intercostal artery bleed after mobilizing and beginning physiotherapy. He has a massive hemothorax. He collapses, he arrests. We take the call, we bring him down to CT. We see these steak knife-like fractures of his ribs. We see an acute large hematoma. We bring him straight to the interventional suite. We cannulate the intercostal arteries and this is hosing blood. We embolize those vessels. We note he's not appropriate in terms of his brain function. We proceed to a cerebral angiography, which shows no effective cerebral blood flow. So we organize a CAT scan, which sadly shows that due to his arrest, he is now brain dead compared to his admission imaging. It's worth noting that the interventional radiologist in this case took the first call, organized the CT angiography, organized and did the interventional intercostal embolization, had the presence of mind to proceed immediately to cerebral angiography, proving that there was probably brain death, and then organized the CT scan to confirm the diagnosis along with the clinic. This patient who's in for some time has a vas catheter placed. The vas catheter inadvertently goes into a subclavian artery, which can happen. Again, a very difficult site for a vascular surgeon or a cardiothoracic surgeon in terms of vessel control. Through brachial, aortic, and catheter access, we can get that out close the hole endovascularly and move on. This patient inadvertently has a screw of thoracic aortic fixation, which has entered the aorta. I'm not sure it would ever have caused harm, but the surgeon preferred to have it out. We're able to provide support and backup endovascularly, prove that when the screw comes out, there's no bleed. If there had been a bleed, we can tamponade it and stent it. A number of patients come out to see us many years after a major trauma, and we find chronic um, pseudoaneurysms, which make you think that do all of them need an acute therapy? But either way, once they're found, they're often large and calcified and treated with endovascular. There are cases that make you quite tired and weary. This very large BMI patient had a tibial plateau fracture, was managed very well but unfortunately developed a DVT and a massive pulmonary embolism, which caused right heart strain, deviation of the septum, and on CAT scan and echo, we can see 
a clot the size of a sausage going across the patent frame in a valley and embarking on heading up to his brain vessels and beyond. He goes to theatre for removal of this clot and what intraoperatively he requires a filter because of ongoing PE concerns. We put the filter in while he's asleep and five years later he continues to sue us for putting it in without consent and not removing it in a timely fashion. Let's move on to how we're going to provide these services. Well, I would just suggest to you that if you don't get the logistics right, things don't work and you need a circle of care. We're embedded. We're very clinical in interventional radiology. You may not realize, but we run our own outpatients. We admit our own patients. We discharge our own patients. We round on our own patients. As I said to you, we're moving along a specialty development. We do a very large proportion of our working day in unscheduled care. Uh, we also have quite a growing practice in scheduled care, particularly in oncology and other areas like venous intervention. And this is not easily suited to adding in trauma. So we're going to have to think about that. We hold ourselves to a theatre standard. And as a result of that, we would have expectations in terms of support of anaesthesia and anaesthesia out of theatre. If the choice is made to deal with a splenic bleed by embolization, I feel we should have as much right to a, a anesthesia support as if that same patient was going to theatre for a splenectomy. But we need better data to prove our job and what we're doing. Where next? Well, a couple of commentaries and maybe some advice and, and tips. The first thing is not to be a hammer and nail. Vendors and companies and others are coming out with new kit all the time. We have to stand back and really pursue technology assessment in terms of assessing the role of some of these devices. This is a device we're using currently for removing large clot from the pulmonary arteries in the acute phase and elsewhere. This may well have a role in trauma. The Reboa, we all know about it, but the, unfortunately our literature also has some fairly catastrophic outcomes from use of this device. We have to think about appropriateness, we have to think about context and when we apply these new technologies. We're doing a, a post-mortem and forensic imaging, including trauma in the uh, Matter Hospital. I think it might have a benefit, but I'm not sure in terms of us understanding trauma and where it's going and how can we better help patients through these difficult times. As an educational point, I think it's worth sharing some of my vulnerabilities. I've been doing this a long time. I'm in my 50s now. Uh, I do find it harder um, to go back to work the following day when I'm up from 3 o'clock till 6 a.m. But I've been really lucky to be joined in my department by a number of young people who are really good at what they do. And I would certainly be working towards a planned obsolescence so that when the time comes for me to walk off the pitch and I shouldn't be doing some of this stuff that maybe is a young man's game, that there is an appropriate number of people who can do the same kind of things that I do. What about best practice in Ireland? Well, we are working on specialty recognition through the Irish Medical Council for um, interventional radiology. That will have a very important trickle down effect for our nursing colleagues and radiographers and others. Nursing no long, does not get recognition, doesn't get paid, and therefore there is no interventional nursing on call in Ireland. We are going to probably move our radiology trainees to get involved in interventional radiology earlier in their registrar training and specialize earlier, and that's an international best practice, as is specialty recognition for interventional radiology. And obviously we're going to be guided by Keith and his colleagues um, in trauma as to where next. There is some governance out there. It's pretty 20,000 feet up. It's pretty light and it clearly doesn't demonstrate great insight into the job. I'll finish with a few tips about interventional radiology in general. Uh, minimally invasive does not necessarily mean better. Minimally invasive does not uh, mean it's safer and it's frequently less controlled. Technical success does not mean we've delivered care. There's too many case reports like that. There are no minor procedures. As a comedian said, those are procedures done on other people. Just because you can does not mean you should, because you can nearly always can in, in interventional radiology. And don't ever make a simple surgery, a complex endovascular procedure.
hope I've addressed most of the teaching points I hoped, and I thank you for your attention. So thanks very much, Leo. I, I'm not sure that Leo has dialed in yet. Hopefully he will before the end. Uh, I'm not so impressed by him showing my uh, trans classic aortic screw technique, but there you have it. Um, so finally, and again, I think it, it is prudent to wait to give the talks we've heard of everybody. And um, it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Jim O'Connor um, to give us a talk from the surgeon's perspective. I suppose those of us who are fellows and members of the RCSI are probably listening to emergency medicine consultants and radiologists telling us how to manage these things and bristling a little bit. Um, but I suspect Jim will bring some balance from the surgical perspective, although I, I suspect it will be very balanced. So thanks very much, Jim. Well, it's a pleasure. First of all, I want to, I want to thank uh, the college and, and both Ronan and, and Yuki for the invitation. Um, it's going to be interesting because some of the things that I'm going to talk about really do tie into both what Fran and Leo were talking about. So, um, uh, so that my talk is really going to be on the initial evaluation and decision making for thoracic trauma. Uh, I know it's a short talk, so I'm going to really just focus on a couple of key points. Next slide, please. So that's where I work. Uh, we're the only freestanding trauma hospital in the country. Uh, University of Maryland Hospital is right behind us. Helipad here. We see about 5,000 patients a year, give or take. Uh, and unlike uh, our civilized folks in Europe, our penetrating trauma is fairly high. About a third of the patients we see have a penetrating injury. And just the, up to the, this week in Baltimore, a town of about 600,000 people, we've had uh, 270 odd homicides. So uh, sadly, we see our fra fair share of trauma. Uh, and my office, by the way, is, is right here. So I'm really close to the, uh, the operating room. So it's uh, quite, quite handy. Next slide, please. So real quick on the introduction, a little bit on the background, not a lot of data. Uh, evaluation of shock and bleeding, where are they bleeding and if so, where? What is the initial crucial information that you need, in, including laboratory data? You know, we have to remind our junior faculty and, and some of our trainees, it's sometimes really good idea to actually examine the patient. Uh, I know that's kind of old school, getting whatever imaging we think is appropriate. And then the initial decision, is this someone that needs to go to the operating room? Uh, if not, do I need additional information and how can I manage them non-operatively? And I just want to touch very briefly on blunt aortic injury, because <clears throat> I'm sure that's something, as, as Leo mentioned, that uh, I'm sure you, you probably see more of uh, with road traffic accidents. Next slide, please. So thoracic trauma is very common. Uh, typically blunt is much greater than penetrating injuries. It accounts for about a quarter of the deaths uh, in, tra in the trauma population and contributes to probably another 50%. And it's the second leading cause of death in the first hour with central nervous system injury being the first. Next, please. The good news in all of this is that 85% of the patients pretty much can be managed non-operatively. A chest strain, good analgesia, uh, whether that's patient controlled or administered, chest physical therapy, incentive spirometry, getting the patient up and moving. That handles literally 85% of the thoracic injuries, which is the good news. And that's both blunt and penetrating. The bad news is of the 15% that are left, they tend to have fairly significant injuries, uh, major vessel, uh, cardiac injury, or a, a major pulmonary injury. They often present in shock and the mortality there is pretty high. The operative mortality can go up to 40%. And the reason is that you've eliminated an awful lot of patients that didn't need surgery. And hemorrhage is the leading cause of preventable deaths. So it's it, we always got to think about bleeding. Next slide, please. So the initial evaluation needs to you consider the mechanism. I'm, I'm sure uh, in Ireland, most of it is going to be a blunt mechanism. Uh, the evaluation needs to be rapid, it needs to be thorough, it needs to be systematic, and it, and it needs to be done the same way every time. Vital signs, physical exam, plain chest x-rays, and we utilize uh, physician or surgeon performed 
uh, ultrasound at the point of care. And we use the extended fast exam. So we look at chest, cardiac, as well as abdomen. Uh, and the fast exam can be done rapidly by those folks who are trained. All of our, our surgical folks do that, who do trauma. Uh, and it's, it's very sensitive and a very specific test, especially when looking for pericardial fluid. Next slide, please. How do we define hypotension? I mean, historically, when I uh, came through, it was uh, blood pressure less than 90. But there's more recent data that would suggest that maybe a blood pressure less than 110 actually uh, would, would define hypotension. And that's some data out of uh, Eastman and, and his colleagues. And the other thing that we continue to learn is that you can be in shock and have a normal blood pressure. So when people walk by and see what appears to be a normal blood pressure, does, that does not exclude the fact the patient could be in severe hemorrhagic shock. Next slide, please. So, you know, shock is nothing more than inadequate tissue perfusion and you get a metabolic acidosis. So I, I really drive this point home that shock is physiology and not blood pressure. Those numbers that you see is a, small, is a study that we did on penetrating thoracic injury of patients that went to the operating room within about four hours, and most of them went within about an hour or so. And they're in, the average blood pressure was 115. They were minimally tachycardic, and yet they had a pH of 7.2. So why is that? Because they're young patients, they compensate well. So again, you can be you can be led down the garden path just um, on exam. Do they have cool extremities? Do they have pedal pulses? And obviously things like lactate, uh, a blood gas is outstanding, gives you the pH, gives you the base deficit. So you get a sense of how well they're compensating. So it's really, you, you, uh, I, I think we need, I have to, in my mind and in our trainees' mind, separate blood pressure from shock. Next slide, please. So this is kind of tongue in cheek a little bit. What are the most common causes of hypotension and trauma? You know, we, we kind of jokingly in a way, it's bleeding, hemorrhage, and exsanguination. In somebody who comes in with trauma, the first three things on your differential are bleeding, and then everything else is secondary. And there's really only five places you can bleed to death. You can die from blood other places. You can die from cardiac tamponade. You can die from a terrible uh, a brain injury with a huge subdural or epidural. But there's really only five cavities where you can exsanguinate. One is the chest, big pleural spaces. You can put a lot of blood. You, certainly the abdomen, pelvis and retroperitoneum, massive long bone fractures, and the street. And what I mean by the street is the person who might have gotten shot or stabbed and had a a brachial artery injury or a, a superficial femoral artery injury who left a large portion of their circulating volume on the street. So that's where you can bleed to death, only five places. Next slide, please. So then if that's the case, how do you then figure out where they're bleeding? So if they're bleeding in, how do you evaluate the chest? Well, the FAST exam is great. You can see lung sliding. You can look at the pericardium and see if they have cardiac tamponade. You can get a chest x-ray rapidly and see if they have hemothorax. I think physical exam is a little bit difficult in a, in a, in a busy trauma bay in the emergency department. You can't always hear everything. For the abdomen, again, the FAST exam is fantastic. Uh, uh, again, performed by the physician at, at, or surgeon at the bedside. Uh, physical exam, if the abdomen is really distended, Diagnostic peritoneal lavage is, is something we used in the old days, but you can still use it. It's a very good test. You put a catheter in, if it comes back positive, you got your answer. Pelvis and retroperitoneum, the, the exam, at least for pelvic fractures, is if there's some degree of pelvic instability, and certainly a plain film will help you out. Ultrasound is not very useful since these are retroperitoneal structures, but CT angiogram is really the way to go, and I think Leo mentioned that's one of our screening tests in, in the stable patient. Next, please. Long bone fractures, usually on exam you can tell and you get plain films, and, and I'm talking about somebody that has blown up bilateral uh, femoral fractures or some combination of femoral fracture and, and a bad tibial fracture. Next, please. And last is the street. Often your first, your Initial responders can tell you there was a significant amount of blood 
at the scene or in the back of their ambulance. Sometimes they'll come in with external bleeding or they had enough bleeding that someone put on a tourniquet. Next slide, please. So I, I think that once you, you get the sense that you have a patient who's in shock and you kind of go through the, that algorithm of where do you think they're bleeding, you can rule out most things relatively quickly with the exception maybe of a retroperitoneum that needs further imaging. So who needs to immediately go to the operating room? Are they in shock? That's that's be a good indication. If you put in a chest strain and you get out 1,500 cc's, I learned it back when I did my residency training that it was a liter. So I still kind of go on the lower end. If you put a chest strain in, you get a liter of blood out, they're going to the operating room. And the other thing to remember about that is you can put the chest strain in, you get whatever comes out, there still can be a large retained hemothorax. Do they have ongoing chest tube output bleeding, you know, 200 cc's an hour for a few hours. Do they have a cardiac injury, which you diagnosed either on physical exam, which is highly unlikely, or using ultrasound, or do they have an aerodigestive injury, tracheal or esophageal? Next, please. Do you need additional, so let's say the patient doesn't need to go immediately to the operating room. What, what additional information is helpful? And, and, and again, you know, tagging on to what Leo said, absolutely. CTA is, is a wonderful diagnostic modality. I think it's really important that th that's carried out in a patient who's hemodynamically stable. You really don't want to send someone who's you know, uh, significantly hypotensive and shock over to the scanner. Uh, some folks need bronchoscopy or esophagoscopy if you're worried about an aerodigestive injury. We tend not to do formal echocardiography. Again, most of what we do is, is uh, surgeon performed. And some patients need angiography. So you get a CTA and you see pelvic bleeding. And again, that's when the interventional, in our hands, it's our vascular surgeons who do the interventions uh, for trauma. But that's the other modality that may be helpful. Next slide, please. So once you've made the decision that you have, you're gonna go to the operating room, Unlike the abdomen, where a, a midline laparotomy incision gets you everything you want, in the chest, you have a couple of options. So how do you think through that? And I always say, listen, the inst if you can't see it, you can't fix it. So you need outstanding exposure. You never compromise. And the other thing is the incision for trauma should be versatile. It should be rapid, and the surgeon should be familiar with it. So I call it the incision decision. And I love this quote from an American surgeon back in the early uh, 20th century, pray before surgery, but remember God will not alter a faulty incision. Uh, so how you think through the, uh, the operative approach in the chest, I think is important. Again, in the abdomen, it's, it's much, much more straightforward because it's a midline laparotomy incision. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the the various approaches we talked about. I think the standard approach is an anterolateral thoracotomy. Uh, you can see from the, the the diagram on the top, I like to bump the patient up about 20 or 30 degrees and really extend the ipsilateral arm. It's an it's a, uh, incision that can be done quickly. You get pretty good exposure to the left chest and the heart. Surgeons are familiar with it. Disadvantages, posterior structures, uh, and the mediastinum, you're not going to see very well. You can see from the cadaveric picture, which is out of our lab, that um, the handle for the retractor is towards the axilla. That way, if you have to come across and do a, a clamshell thoracotomy, you can do that easily. And I tend to take that incision way up into the axilla because you get much better exposure posteriorly. Next slide. Uh, and. Again, this is now the clamshell, which uh, I believe uh, Fran mentioned. And I think, again, surgeon familiarity, you get excellent exposure to both pleural spaces and the mediastinum. Again, that's a, that picture is from uh, a cadaveric specimen from our lab. Um, and you really get outstanding exposure. The, the disadvantages are you don't see much that you don't have very good visualization of posterior structures. And the incision, you need to come across the sternum. If you come across the xiphoid, you're too low. Next slide. The other two incisions I'm just going to mention briefly. I think it, uh, sternotomy is something that I, the thoracic and cardiac surgeons are probably much more familiar with. 
And I, I think the poster lateral thoracotomy, which most of us have done for elective surgery, the disadvantages of that is it's not at all versatile. Once you put the patient up on their side, they're in the lateral decubitus position, you can extend the incision. You can see on that sternotomy incision, you can take it down as a laparotomy, you can extend it to the neck, you can extend it out to the clavicle. Put somebody in a lateral position, you don't have that. And also in a patient who is marginal, their hemodynamics are marginal, you put them up in the lateral position, oftentimes their hemodynamics will really object. Next slide. The last thing I want to talk about is uh, blunt aortic injury, and I think this ties into to what Leo was talking about. It's obviously a, rap a rapid horizontal deceleration, and most commonly it's in a road traffic accident. The classic finding is a, is a widened mediastinum or loss of the aortic contour on a plain chest radiograph. Um, the, the diagnosis has really changed. When, again, years ago when I was a resident, everyone got angiography now. CT angiography is so good at, at uh, defining the injury, and we also can talk about grading it. And then I want to talk a little bit about the initial management, what can you do in A&E, and then definitive management, which is not always operative. Sometimes it's, it's medical management. Uh, next, please. So the medical management is really fairly straightforward. You put people on an antihypertensive, um, and you also want to decrease the impulse pressure or, uh, on the aorta. So you, you put them on a beta blocker. And I, I think you can see the slope of that line, uh, which is pressure over time. You really want it going towards the right. And the, the question is, well, what should the blood pressure and heart rate targets be? And we don't know. We all kind of have our own thing. Um, but mine, I, I like the systolic blood pressure between 100 and 110 and a heart rate less than 70 as long as they're maintaining end organ perfusion. But that is the one thing that you can do in the in A and E before you do anything else to really minimize the chance of uh, of, of a rupture from the the aortic injury. Next slide, please. So the management has changed tremendously. Again, when I was a, a resident and cardi in, in training in cardiac, and even when I was in practice initially. You came in with an aortic injury, injury like that, you got an angiogram and you went to the operating room and we fixed it operatively uh, with some degree of distal perfusion, but it was an open technique. And in, uh, that has changed dramatically. There were two studies in the US uh, just about 10 years apart from the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma. And uh, when uh, the first one that came out, that's those where you see the mortality numbers. Over that 10, 12 year period, mortality dropped from 31% to slightly less than 13%. Why? Because there were much fewer open repairs and TVAR was the way these were managed. Similarly, in that same period, the paraplegia rate dropped from 8.7% to 1.6%. So the, the, the C change from going from an operative approach to using TVAR uh, has really dramatically impacted the way we care for patients that have traumatic aortic rupture. Um, we kind of joke at, at our institution, we see a fair number of these, and there's probably only two or three of us of the senior characters uh, who know how to do an open operation for the for an aortic injury because the T-bar uh, is just so, it's it really works extraordinarily well. One thing we don't know is long-term results. Uh, because you're putting these in, you know, young, younger folks and you, you want to follow them over time. Next slide, please. The question always was, we took patients when they first came in directly to the operating room to fix this. And there was a study that came out, I, I guess it was, oh, I don't know, uh, 2009, give or take. Um, and the patients were randomized into going less than 24 hours within 24 hours or after 24 hours for T-bar. And the results were the same. There were no ruptures during that time. Um, there was really no difference at all in outcome, as long as the patients were adequately treated. A, a similar study out of our institution looking at those patients that had traumatic brain injury, those are the patients in whom a delayed repair is beneficial. So the patient that has a traumatic brain injury Delaying the repair for 24, 48 hours is, is more protective 
again, there were no ruptures and there was no decrement in their neurologic function. Uh, and I think we that came out, I don't remember, the 2014 or 15. Um, so again, the, the, the sea change in the way we take care of the aortic injuries is, is astounding and the results are fabulous. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah, and then if, if you, there are some injuries where you can do definitive management. And if you do that, definitive medical management, and if you do that, you just need to get serial imaging. And those are used for selected, uh, very low grade injuries. Next slide. Um, I think there was one slide missing, but that's okay because it was on the grade of injury. So the higher the grade of injury, those are the ones, grade three and four, which have large pseudoaneurysms. Those are the ones you really want to go after early with uh, an endovascular approach, catheter based. Grade one injuries, by and large, we treat uh, medically. Uh, with intervals. We go ahead and do some interval imaging. And then there's some grade two in injuries, which are kind of in the middle with small pseudoaneurysms. Usually we get serial imaging. If they're getting better on imaging, then we continue with medical management. If it's unchanged or if it's uh, worsening, then they get an intervention. So I think the conclusions here, the vast majority of thoracic trauma can be managed non-operatively. That's a great take-home message. Again, chest strain, uh, adequate analgesia, all the things we do from a respiratory standpoint. Shock is physiology, it's not blood pressure. Hemorrhage is what kills us early. There's only five places you can bleed to death, and it's relatively easy to evaluate each. For those patients that need to go to the operating room, give some thought to what I call the incision decision. Certainly a clamshell thoracotomy gets you the exposure that you need. And that the diagnosis and management of blood aortic injury has really changed uh, for the better, for the patients. The outcomes are so much better. Next slide, please. I, I just love this quote because I think it really talks, talk, speaks to what we do when we're in the trauma bay. That true genius resides in the capacity for evaluation of uncertain, hazardous, and conflicting information. I want to thank a couple of people. Next slide, please. Uh, on the left, that's my, those are my paternal grandparents uh, from Kerry. And on the right, my maternal grandmother from Tipperary. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here. So uh, next slide, please. And the last folks I want to thank are all of you for, for listening and for the invitation to uh, share some of uh, uh, what we do here in the States. So thank you again. That, that's super. Thanks very much, Jim. We're, we're grateful that uh, that you're giving a little bit back after your ancestors left Street Shores a long time ago. And I know you've been very helpful to me with lots of advice and down through the years. Um, I, think, I think time is running a little bit short, but I'm sure there are plenty of questions to be asked. And again, I kind of suggested at the start, one of the big ones is, is who should do it, where they should do it. Um, and I think both Fran and Jim and Leo kind of gave different perspectives of saying, um, Ronan asked one very practical question that perhaps Fran and Jim might answer. And I know, Fran, I've heard you given the answer before, but the difference between a clamshell and, a, and an anterolateral thoracotomy, given what you're trying to do in the majority of time is address the heart? Yeah, I, I think that the, uh, at least in my hands, through a left anterolateral thoracotomy, I don't get as good exposure, especially to the right side of the heart. So my practice is if I'm doing a resuscitative thoracotomy, I'm going to come across the sternum. That way, I know that I have control, total control of the heart. Um, uh, Fran's point about, you know, you relieve the tamponade. Those are the patients you tend to save are the ones that have tamponade. And I just put my finger on it. Uh, you know, I know there's people that say you can staple it, you can put a Foley catheter in. I, I just I just put my finger on it. And at that point, try to get them to the operating room and, and repair it. Uh, but again, my in my hands, doing a bringing it across the sternum, then I know I have every bit of the heart that I want to look at. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Jim. Um, again, there's a good chance a lot of people, uh, on again, on these shores, and I know I keep referring to that, but there's a good chance they may only do one or two of these in their whole career. Um, and I think you need to uh, give it your best shot and definitely a clamshell uh, is the best shot of, of being able to identify something that's gone wrong. I was a left lateral person when I started. That's how I was taught. And uh, in the hands of the right operator, it could be the right technique. Uh, 
but really uh, that the clamshell gives you what you need, the exposure, but also to fix it if you are trying to fix something. I know you said about the finger, but trying to get your hands into that, that small enclosed space can be difficult. So clamshell is the one, I think. Agreed. And maybe Fran, I might have a question for you, and I'm kind of leading a little bit, but these are very rare, and I suppose in 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 my in my life, the other very rare thing that I never want to come across is an engine failure failure in an airplane. And the way you practice for that is with simulation. Um, so I presume there's a role for simulation, so you can practice if this comes across your your table, and how how might people learn to do it and get the skills without having a volume to do it. Yeah, so I think, um, and I think Paul Balf has, has mentioned it there about, you know, how, how do we get this going on a, on a more national conversation? I think this is, uh, I mean, this isn't the start of it tonight, but this is a good way to, to bring it to the fore. Um, we need to be preparing people, we need to be educating, and that needs to be happening on multiple sites. And I know that as part of your work, Keith, there is a work stream dedicated to education. And I know that RCSI have taken a big interest in this and advocating more trauma kind of training and etc so look that that's realistically the, the way we're going to start this and uh, people who are interested in it like me um and, and others who who are out there so uh, I, I but i think you got to prepare you have to we have to be prepared for these patients because we can save their lives absolutely we know we can and so uh, kind of putting it to the uh, kind of the background and saying you can't be doing these crazy maneuvers in the ed those days are gone you know um so we got to be prepared for them yeah i think that's spot on certainly Certainly, uh, uh, having really preparing, going through, doing simulations, and the other thing I would suggest is there are courses where that's offered. I know DSTS, uh, part of the DSTS course is on how to do a a, a a resuscitative thoracotomy, and I think your points, you know, Fran, about timing. Uh, how how long has the patient been down? Hard to know. The decision making is really the tough part. Do I or don't I? Uh, the technique itself is really fairly straightforward. I think we we sometimes overcomplicate the chest. If, if thoracic surgery was that complicated, I couldn't do it because I'm all not I'm not all that smart. There's too many more organs in the abdomen. There's only a couple in the chest. I can deal with that. Um, and, and I and I think the uh, you know getting your team ready and and know what they're going to do uh, is really key. And, and you're right. It's it's not going to happen often, but it can indeed be life saving. Thanks very much. Uh, and I suppose there's another plug. W I, I visited Belfast last weekend. We are hoping, or they are hoping, to bring the DSTS course to the island of Ireland. And I know they've been speaking to Morgan about it. Um, and, and hopefully it will be another all-island um, teaching opportunity because we're looking to secure funds from down here. Um, I'm really appreciative of, of people giving their time and from around the world. It's a great example of the format. I, I know Leo has, has signed on and he gave a great talk and he did it despite being away on holidays in gym. We couldn't be more grateful of somebody taking the time to dial in from the US. I, I heard during your talk, he even managed to have kind of the stage siren going off in the background to tell us what the call center was. Um, it must be your, your phone ringtone or something. Um, but again, th thank you very much. And thank you, President, for, for uh, inviting us to present an interesting topic, which I knew very little about. And uh, I think I know a little bit more about now. So. Well, thank you, Keith. And, and thank you, uh, Fran, uh, Jim and Leo. Uh, I'm very pleased that we will have recorded this uh, um, and it will be uh, accessible to our fellows and members uh, through the website so that uh, it, it will be a repository that people can refer to and uh, and look back on. Um, I am uh, looking forward to uh, the progression of the trauma plan, uh, Keith, and as we roll it out, I think it will be very much to the benefit of Irish patients, but I certainly hope the only clams I see will be on, uh, on the <laughs> will be on the restaurant uh, uh, menu. But there you are. Thank you all so much and uh, good evening. We'll see you again uh, in two weeks time. Thank you. Thank you again. My Thank pleasure. You. Thank you.